Fred, uh, how did you get, get involved in the Holocaust issue? It seemed like you were an innocent person in life. Yeah. I mean, how, what, what brought you into it? Yeah, I wasn't even a revisionist at the time. Uh, it just happened that I, I was an expert on execution equipment because I had been manufacturing it for several years. And uh, I was uh, contacted by Dr. Robert Forreston, who was on uh, uh, Ernst Zundel's defense team in Canada. And he was being tried on charges of, uh, of uh, it was a freedom of speech crime that he was being charged with. Uh, a Jewish lady decided that uh, he said things about the Holocaust that weren't true. And essentially what he did is he published a, a brochure that was available in England and there was no problem with it there, but it was called Did Six Million Really Die? And it was only a, a four panel pamphlet, but uh, at any rate she she filed a criminal complaint and they charged him with it and uh, he went to trial and he was found guilty. After he was found guilty they appealed it and they, they struck the trial down and they ordered a new trial and uh, the second trial it was decided that they were going to try to prove that there were no gas chambers. So they had to look around for somebody who was an expert on gas chambers. And I was the only one on the planet that was. And so Robert Farson contacted me. And uh, when he came, he didn't tell me what he came for. He just came and asked me some questions. And he said, do you believe in the Holocaust? And I said, yeah. I, I said, I imagine so. I said, uh, I don't know. So. He said, well, I'll have to get back to you. That night he got on the telephone he called, and he, he called Ernst and he said to Ernst Rundle, uh, we got a problem. This guy believes in the Holocaust. So Ernst said, bring him up anyway. And uh, so they, they brought me up. He met with me again. He told me what it was for. And he said, would I be willing to do that? I said, sure. And uh, I went to Canada. I met with him. I got a ton of material to review. Uh, the, um, I had an unbelievable amount of material to review in, in something like three weeks. And I became an expert on the Holocaust in that short period of time. But at any rate, uh, they sent me to Poland. Uh, I, had, I had a crew, I had a draftsman with me, I had my wife with me. I had uh, uh, a whole entourage of people. I mean, we had translators, we had a, 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 a ramrod who ran the whole show and got us uh, got us to locations and, and cars and everything else. And at any rate, I looked at the facilities and I decided that, uh, that, uh, that the facilities were not gas execution chambers and I came back and uh, I testified in court. And uh, that was before I knew what was going to happen to me. Now, I would have done it anyway because I believe that, uh, that anybody has a, any criminal has a right to a and when I say criminal, I don't mean Ernst was a criminal, but he was charged as a criminal. He had a right to a fair trial. He had a right to the best trial he could muster, the best attorney he could get, and the best experts that he could get. And I was a certified expert in the United States in both state and federal court. So it was just a walk-in. And even though the judge at Canada didn't want me, he didn't have a hell of a lot of choice. And uh, as most exterminationists are, they're stupid. And uh, he refused, the judge refused to accept my report as a report. I had to testify every word of the report into the record. Now he would have been better off if he just took the report and said, thank you, now leave Mr. Lucia, but he didn't. I was on the stand, I was on the, uh, the, the stand for almost two days. And I testified as to everything that was there and the news media was greedily writing everything down, which was, it, it didn't do him any good. But now he decided he was going to stop this thing and he shut me down. He wasn't going to let me testify on, on crematoria. Well, you know, before I went, I worked at a crematory here in Massachusetts for over a week. And I cremated bodies. I ran the bone crunches and everything that they had. So I was fully familiar with how it was done. Uh, I was, uh, I had uh, read up what was done in the past, so I knew the difference in coal and oil and coke, etc. And, uh, but he refused to let me testify. So, Ernst's Ernst defense team, and he had a good defense team, Doug Christie, Christie brought a gentleman in who was an expert on crematories. He was, his name was 
Legace, Ivan Legace. He was the top crematory person in Canada. And he was given my report, he read it, and he got on the stand and he testified that everything in the report is exactly correct. Fred Lucha has done nothing incorrect. It is all proper. And he testified every word of my report into the record. So again, uh, the judge made a mistake. He should have just accepted it and put it in his pocket, but he didn't. And here he had the top Canadian crematory expert certifying that everything I said was correct. Now, my findings in the report indicated that these facilities were not and could never have been used as gas execution facilities. And I have three main reasons for that. The first reason is that the, the facilities were ludicrous. They could not have supported the function of gas execution. The second reason is that gas executions cannot be done on a mass basis. We generally cannot execute more than two or three people at the same time. There are physical constraints, which I'll get into in a moment. And the third reason is that all of the information supplied by the alleged witnesses to the gas chambers, the survivors to the gas chambers, or whatever you want to call these people, they were people that were in the concentration camps, nothing they say, say or said makes any sense. They talk about handling dead bodies that were, that were poisoned with gas and eating sandwiches at the same time. The gas is dangerous. It precipitates on the body, and you'd kill yourself if you handled the body without gloves, and certainly you didn't want to ingest anything. But at any rate, these are my three reasons. The first is that the facilities could never have supported gas execution. The second reason being, uh, the second reason is that it's impossible to do mass executions with gas. And the third reason is that nothing that the people that were there said makes any sense. So there's, there are no witnesses. There's no reason even to consider them to be gas chambers. All right, let's go back to the first reason. The facilities at Auschwitz uh, were actually morgues. In order to have gas execution, you've got to have a high enough temperature. It has to be over 73 degrees in order to vaporize the gas and to get it to circulate through the room. There were no heaters. There were heaters in the, uh, the facilities where they did the delousing, but not where they allegedly did the murders. So, uh, there was no facility for heating, there was no facility for circulating, and there was no facility for exhausting the gas. The doors on the facility were made out of wood, and they were ungasketed, so it would have leaked out. The means of getting the alleged gas of the Zyklon B into the gas chamber was through holes in the roof, and the SS officers presumably took fistfuls of the, of the Zyklon B and threw it onto an ice-cold floor where the gas wouldn't sublimate, and sublimate is the word for vaporizing uh, in chemical terms, it wouldn't sublimate and go through the roof. Uh, third, the gas is highly explosive, and if you put a lot of people in the room, somebody would have managed to generate a spark with a nail in his boot or something and blow the gas chamber up. Fourth, they didn't have any explosion-proof lights and switches. So if you flip the switch or the light was on, you would have blown the facility up anyway. And then there was no door separating the uh, alleged gas chamber and the, uh, and the uh, crematory. So the poison gas would have gone into the open fire on a crematory, and that would have blown something up. And then on top of that, there were floor drains in the gas chamber. Again, remember, it was a morgue. So the poison gas would have gone into the floor drain, would have gone out into the main sewer line of the camp, and would have filtered its way back up into the commandant's toilet and bubbled up, and the commandant would have executed himself. So, so wouldn't you agree that they took a story of a real morgue, embellished it, and turned it into the gassing. Right, right. And the people that talked about it, the people that invented the gassing story, had no concept of what was necessary to do a gassing. So, I mean, 
what they did is they just cobbled a lot of foolishness together. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. The second problem we have is that as an expert on, on gas chambers, it's not possible to build a gas chamber that's going to kill three or four or five hundred people or whatever number of people they said. We have trouble killing two and three people. There was no gas chamber that was ever built that held over two people. Because in the first place, Zyklon B is not the way you do it. You only get a limited amount of gas by heating it in the sublimation because what they what they do when they make the Zyklon B is take chalk pellets and they absorb the poison gas into the pellets. And then they have to heat the pellets later to boil the gas off. Well, when we when we have a gas execution in the United States, and this is the only way it's ever been done, we generate the gas in the chamber by dropping sodium cyanide or potassium cyanide pellets into it, and they call the pellets eggs. We drop them into a, a, a solution of 7% sulfuric acid. The acid generates and dissolves the hydrogen cyanide pellets. The gas comes up, and this the, the gas is generated directly on